it's a great privilege for me to be asked to give one of the upper room lectures, as it happens, <clears throat> the first such lecture. I've got an enormous admiration for the work of the upper room and for the commitment of the excellent staff and, of course, the work of the trustees, too. I was appointed uh, as a clerk in the House of Lords. The clerks are the senior administrative staff of the House. On the 11th of October 1971, it happened to be my 22nd birthday. I mention that because it aroused great interest in the rather Dickensian accountant of the House of Lords, who could not get over what was to him the interesting fact that my birth date coincided with my incremental date. <laughs> <laughs> Someone asked me the other day, and I think it was probably the answer that I gave was going to determine whether they came this evening. Are you a, were you a man in tights? <laughs> and I'm afraid the answer is yes, although I only had to wear them mercifully on ceremonial occasions, not every day. I confess that I never really enjoyed wearing the uniform. Bits had, bits had a habit of coming undone, and I sometimes forgot which dry cleaners I had left them in. <laughs> Preparing this talk it made me think how very different work and the world in general were in 1971. The House of Lords was still overwhelmingly hereditary and conservative. Life peers were first appointed in 1958, but not then in the sort of numbers they are today. There were members, of course, attending the House born in the 1880s, even a few in the 1870s when I arrived. And there were some remarkable characters. On my third day, to my astonishment, a very elderly peer walking by was identified to me as the person on whom Bridie, the character in Bride's Head Revisited, was based. <laughs> Combining an iconic grade one listed building of international importance with a busy working parliament is not easy. And there's a huge amount of necessary maintenance and restoration. The new palace, as it's called, built in the 1840s after the Great Fire of 1834, is a very remarkable building. It has over 1,100 rooms, 100 staircases, 35 passenger lifts, and two miles of corridors. And yes, I did get hopelessly lost in my first few weeks. Uh, I've got one or two. These are the great state rooms. The Royal Gallery, through which the Sovereign, the Queen, processes on her way to the Chamber of the House of Lords. The idea is to give you some idea of, of what the upkeep of the building is like. This is one of the division lobbies through which members vote, and where I used to spend many quite happy hours crossing off their names in the early part of my career. The Prince's Chamber, just outside the House of Lords Chamber, where members congregate and gossip, and the throne in the chamber of the House of Lords. Um, you can see, you get narrow if I do this, yes, you, uh, you can see the throne has been restored, but these Magna Carta barons along the side have yet to be properly restored. Uh, so there's a huge amount of work to be done. Oh, these yeah. are the original Acts of Parliament written on parchment, <laughs> animal skin. Still today, uh, the House of Lords have tried several times to have parchment replaced by paper, which seems not an unreasonable thing to do. But it's been rejected on two occasions. Guess who by? The House of Commons. <laughs> <laughs> I've said a fair bit about the past and about the staff, so I ought to say something about the House of Lords as it is now. First, it is huge, and I mean membership is huge, well over 800 members in total, although 36 can't come for various reasons. Of the remainder, 667 are life peers, 88 are hereditary peers, elected when most of the hereditaries were uh, excluded in 1999, and 26 bishops. The purpose of this slide is to show you how full it gets. I'm not going to take you through this diagram 
just to tell you, it gets so full these days that this area here, where it says bar of the house, which is not a drinking bar, <laughs> a bar which separates the, the, the proper house from uh, the, the, the room outside where visitors can sit, has been taken over by members. They can't speak from here, but there simply isn't room now for everybody to sit. Um, so it's a very large membership. The Lord sit on average for six and a half, seven hours a day. And some 500 now attend uh, each sitting. The party balance, well, I think it might surprise you. It surprised me a bit. Uh, the party balance of the house um, is that. I hope you can see it. Perhaps a bit surprising to see how many Labour members there are, how many independents, known as crossbenchers, there are. And the most surprising thing in a way <coughs> is that the co coalition forces, the Conservatives and Lib Dems, are so far off from having an overall majority. Uh, so that's the party balance. I think the Prime Minister who understood government defeats uh, least was Margaret Thatcher. <laughs> <laughs> she simply couldn't understand. Uh, how a Conservative House of Lords could roundly defeat some of her policies and some of her, uh, her, her bills. And um, I used to get very anxious calls from number 10, fill me with complete terror. <laughs> um, the, the key job of the House of Lords, of course, is to revise and amend legislation brought from the Commons. Or the bills can also start in the Lords. Outside bodies, pressure groups, and so on, often look to the House of Lords rather than the House of Commons uh, to obtain changes and concessions on bills. Uh, amendments, um, thousands of amendments are considered each year and hundreds agreed to. Very often they're government amendments which are agreed to, concessions made to debate either the Commons or the Lords. Now to the most memorable moments of my career. <laughs> well, there is quite a lot of ceremonial, though nothing like as much as you might think. I've seen many addresses by heads of state, uh, which are always memorable moments. Uh, this rather unusual head of state. I very much like this photograph. This is back to ceremonial for a moment. And these are the beef eaters picking up their torches to go on an inspection of the cellars. <laughs> this is President Obama giving a talk in Westminster Hall. And you can see he's made everybody laugh. <laughs> if I can find it, I will tell you what the joke is. <laughs> <laughs> I have known few greater honours, he's just said, than the opportunity to address the Mother of Parliaments in Westminster Hall. I am told that the last three speakers have been the Pope, Her Majesty the Queen, and Nelson Mandela which is either a very high bar or the beginning of a very funny joke. <laughs> <laughs> my final thoughts, and these are, I promise, my final thoughts on the House of Lords and Parliament. In a way, an unelected chamber is an anomaly in the 21st century. These days, parliaments tend to be elected. And the size of the House the tendency for successive governments to insist on topping up their members, coupled with the sheer longevity of members, <laughs> these are problems. And it tends to be a slightly elderly house. Although if you brought in an age restriction, it would be pretty arbitrary. You would exclude some very good members, and you would include some less good ones. <laughs> on the other hand, it is now, in my view, a good second chamber, doing good, helpful work. It's also relatively quiet. There isn't much shouting. There's lots of courtesy, probably a bit too much courtesy. <laughs> and party allegiances are far less strong, which I've always found an attractive feature. All in all, I regard myself as extremely lucky to have had a career working for Parliament. For all its peculiarities, and its faults. Parliament is, in my view, a great institution which we are lucky to have. Would you like to hear the story about my uniform? Yes. <laughs> um, ghastly day, and I had, the House normally sits at 
Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday. And at 2.22, I hadn't started changing. And I started changing. And I couldn't find my black waistcoat. I searched everywhere. I looked under the desk in case I'd thrown it there the night before. I looked everywhere. I could not find my waistcoat. And the Lord Chancellor, had, the Speaker, had already begun to process. So I ripped open my spare kit. And I ripped off the waistcoat and I put it on. And I went into the chamber. The story resumed <coughs> at a much later hour, 8 o'clock that evening. I knew I was due home much earlier. I was going to be in disgrace. Somebody came in and said, Michael, may I please have your advice on something? And I said, Tom, please, I'm going to have to change while you talk to me. Just talk to me. So I started to get changed. And Tom then said to me, Michael, he said, why are you wearing two waistcoats? <laughs> it was that that made me think it was time to retire. <laughs> Thank you very much.